It was, as Edgar Allan Poe says, a cold and rainy night. <laughs> right? Oh. Luther wrote that too? I, oh, man. <laughs> what didn't he write? Good evening and welcome. Fides querens intellectum. Faith ever seeking deeper understanding. This classic Latin tag coined by St. Augustine and later picked up by St. Anselm of Canterbury is the brooding spirit that gives creative impetus to this new Veritas lecture series. The hope and intent is that it will become an annual ongoing series, offering an opportunity to gain a deeper, fuller sense of Veritas, that is, truth. As faith and reason, church and academy, religion and science, theology and culture seek common ground together for an uncommon good. For if the quest for truth is lost or we thumb our nose at it, like Pontius Pilate, as portrayed in the 18th chapter of St. John's Gospel, taking a big long drag on his camel straight cigarette with jauntiest face of incredulity, what is truth? Then there's little point in straightforwardly arguing for the truth or falsity of any claim. What is truth? Without truth and the knowledge of truth, we would wander blindly through life guided only by what we can get before our face full of secondhand smoke. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Not just rhetorical ruffle, that. Hmm? That's a substantive, foundational, and not relative statement. As I sat in Pastor Jeff Backer's uh, seventh grade class last night in confirmation, he was asking a confirmant about sin and the dialogue, and he said, well, what do you think about that? And her comment in return as a seventh grader, well, that's your opinion. That's the culture we live in. So, the quest for truth. And not only for those in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but all people. And so these Veritas lectures are to serve as a ministry for heart as well as mind, gathering people of all backgrounds throughout our congregation, our community, and region in an adventurous, engaging, and exciting exchange of ideas. If you turn briefly to your Veritas brochure that you were handed uh, this evening, earlier, if you open it to the center part, you'll see a word of thanks on the third part of this trifold toward the bottom. I'd like to thank members of First Lutheran's Education and Discipleship Board that you see listed there, along with several of our staff who are hosting tonight and also serving a reception following the forum in the main atrium that follows. And copies of Dr. Paulson's just-released book, Luther's Outlaw God, will be available as well. Tonight is indeed a great joy to introduce an eminently gifted theologian and a longtime cherished friend as I go back now some four decades. I don't know, Steve, maybe 40 years sounds <laughs> like we're a bit younger. Uh, sharing dark nights of the soul uh, on the south side of Chicago. Dr. Paulson is a summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa graduate of St. Olaf College earning a Master of Divinity degree from Luther Seminary in 1984, and then both a Master of Theology and Doctor of Theology degree from the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. He has served as a parish pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church on Washington Island in Wisconsin, served as a wildly popular professor at Concordia College, and I can speak from experience to that because I would sometimes sit in on his classes when I was visiting my grandparents, making my way through 
uh, Fargo-Moorhead to Valley City. And then serving as a professor of systematic theology at Luther Seminary from 1998 to 2018. But now to the delight of many already, Steve and his beloved wife Crystal have taken up townhouse and now dwell among us, as St. John would say. Serving as the new chair of theology at Luther House of Study on the campus of Sioux Falls Seminary. Dr. Paulson is the author of many journal articles and books, most recently Luther for Armchair Theologians, Lutheran Theology, and as of this past month, hot off the press, Luther's Outlaw God, the first volume of his magnum opus of some thousand pages that will be soon out in volume two and three, serving as the basis for his lecture tonight and then again next Tuesday evening at this time. Drop on a saying of Martin Luther, Dr. Paulson is a rare bird. That is, I believe, he well incarnates Jesus' imperative to be wise as a serpent, yet gentle as a dove. I know that his inaugural lecture will, lectures will certainly prove to be a very challenging and yet thrilling theological exchange, such that they will set the stage for the very task lecture series for years to come. Dr. Paulson. Thank you, Pastor Christofferson. It has been 40 years, I know that. Uh, And uh, good ones at that. I want to thank uh, John and Kathy. I want to thank uh, Tom and Jenny and their parents, Pastor Jim and Dorothy Christofferson, for this particular lecture and this situation now. Uh, Luther does say, there is not always occasion, but when the occasion comes, then you want to stand up and open up your mouth and say something worthwhile. Well, this is an occasion, and as usual, uh, John has seen to it that I have had an occasion. Uh, he uh, got me my first job in Concordia and every job since, so I follow him around wherever he's going. Uh, and I'm uh, very uh, happy about that and happy to be here. I want to thank the Education and Discipleship Board here at First Lutheran uh, for uh, thinking of this kind of an event as worthwhile and important since all uh, all, uh, of you are theologians. And that means that you have both a responsibility, uh, Luther says again, you are going to be the bishop. It might only be the bishop of your own home, but there you're the bishop, uh, and there you actually have responsibility for teaching truly to all in the family. And uh, here uh, we can uh, begin to work and identify what that is and how it is that you actually become a theologian of the cross. So all of us are theologians together. The time I'm going to spend with you uh, tonight, I want to talk about in terms of the new book that's just been published. And then, if I ever hope to retire, I'm going to try to sell you some of these uh, so I can get uh, the rewards of this as well. This is the book, Luther's Outlaw God. It's from Fortress Press. I'm going to be talking a little bit about it, Uh, But I warn you, this is a difficult book. And unlike Luther for Armchair Theologians, there are absolutely no cartoons. How do you like that? I used to say that my students at least read one of my books because there were cartoons in them. Uh, But uh, this one has no cartoons, so this is what the grandkids call a chapter book. Uh, And you have to sit down and work through this. But I assure you this can be done since I just got a... uh, an email from DC who told me that she has the book, has been working on it for days, and is now on page four. Uh, And uh, (laughs) I think it's possible for anyone here. Uh, Well, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that today. And uh, this uh, part of the the book, the, uh, the first volume, is especially on what Luther calls the two monsters of theology. Pastor Christofferson has already mentioned this. 
These are predestination, the topic for tonight, and evil, the uh, a topic for next Tuesday when we meet again. And of course, these truly are monsters, and as with any monster, uh, they hide under your bed, and when you try to go to sleep at night, they uh, scare you and uh, come out and actually begin speaking to you in one way or another. Luther uh, says that this is really the source of the great problem for anyone in, uh, in life, Christian or not. That is, they get infected with the predestination sickness. And that predestination sickness is a sickness unto death. That's not only a phrase uh, in Scripture from Paul, but it is a phrase picked up uh, by a notable theologian and philosopher by the name of Soren Kierkegaard, who most of you will at least know of by name. And uh, there he picked up Luther's understanding of what it, mean, what it meant now to have a sickness unto death, the predestination sickness itself. And also the uh, topic that we'll take up next time is the topic that keeps most people away from church, strangely enough, and especially young men who are really troubled by this, that is, why is there evil? Uh, and uh, if you cannot answer this question, then there is bitterness, uh, hostility, and a tendency now not to want to approach uh, a church to say nothing about uh, theological matters themselves. So we'll talk a little bit about that next time. So uh, the uh, title is Luther's Outlaw God, the subtitle, Hiddenness, Evil, and Predestination. I'm going to throw in hiddenness for free, by the way. Uh, but we will take up uh, evil and prede predestination as we go. There was another one of my students, uh, ne'er-do-well as usual, uh, who had uh, ordered this book online from Amazon. Then he said, I got a message from Amazon that was alarming to me. It says, we will be delivering hiddenness, predestination, and death to your door in two days. <laughs> He's still frightened, so he had to call me, and I had to calm him down. It won't hurt you too badly now. Uh, and uh, here we are finally at the Veritas Lectures. This is the first of what I hope will be uh, many lectures over the years in this kind of series. We have a wonderful church here that can in fact, make this an occasion for many people to come and speak about topics that might be scholarly, they might be difficult, they uh, will take a little bit of work, but this is the place that we can do it, and the Veritas lectures now that especially focus on this matter of truth, and as Pastor Christofferson said, the old slogan, faith seeks understanding. So there I want to... Uh, take up this particular issue of truth and faith seeking understanding and then notice right away that Luther does a very interesting uh, change on this particular theme. Faith seeks understanding normally uh, is understood to say I start off in faith as uh, one famous philosopher by the name of Hegel that some of you may have known uh, said you begin with faith in your childhood, in your infancy. Then you progress beyond this infancy into adulthood, no longer seeking only the milk, but the true meat. But the true meat, he began to say, was not faith itself, but was something higher. That is, to become a thinker, ein Denker. And therefore, faith was understood to be lower, smaller, childlike, and thinking uh, was something higher, better, mature, meatier, not just milk, and therefore was really what the Holy Spirit was after. But it was Luther, after all, who noticed that the mistake that the church had made all along was to think that something was actually higher and better than faith. That was the, uh, that was the whole problem. And it almost always went back to the uh, most commonly preached on text, almost never on a Sunday, but always at a wedding. Faith, 
hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Then you enter into it in the middle of a, uh, of a marriage service and ruin absolutely everything, not understanding faith, hope, or love, uh, and the whole thing goes right down the sink without any understanding at all. Now, here uh, we do have to come back to this matter, but Luther now says, really what we're talking about is understanding seeking faith. But it can't find it. It doesn't know where to look. It goes about blindly touching here or there and trying to establish, figure out where it can properly put its faith so that it can have some assurance, some true certainty in life. And so Luther says, now this too we have to understand because the great thing we first must notice is that there is not one truth but two truths. And the truths are not just uh, the truth of an infancy and truth of adulthood, but true truths, two truths that are at odds with one another, fighting one another. The first truth is the truth of the law. The truth of the law will tell you something true. That true thing is that there is a God, that this God has a law, and at the end of all time, God will judge you according to the law. There is the truth of the matter of the law. And lo and behold, most of you are holding yourself in suspense, thinking that you just may be the first one in the entire universe who passes this particular test, and therefore will enter into heaven itself. But Luther is now going to disabuse you of this notion. Also, Paul, the truth of the law ends in this. You are going to die. There is the truth. And most of our time in life then is spent denying that or marginalizing that, setting it over to the side in one way or another. Luther says, no, it's time uh, to be a theologian of the cross who actually tells it like it is and tells you the truth about these matters. However, there is another truth, and this truth is the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel works very differently than the truth of the law it now actually turns and says something quite different than the law to you. It says not on account of what you've done in the works of the law, but on account of Jesus Christ. Excuse me, I might be moving that around. Is that, am I moving something there? All right, you tell me if I, if I need to do something a little different. The, the uh, gospel says the truth uh, now is spoken to you by Christ in a different way than the law. The truth of Christ now sounds like this. On my account, for my sake now, I declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. Here now Luther says this truth now is the one that reigns. And when it reigns, it actually reigns over all other truths, including the truth of the law. So here I want to notice something. Um, the first time truth comes up in the Bible at all, is all the way into the 42nd chapter of Genesis. And some of you have not gotten that far. If you can only get four pages into my book, you're probably only about three or four uh, chapters into Genesis. So let me push you ahead a little bit further and then identify what's going to happen uh, toward the end of Genesis. At the end of Genesis, there's a great story of Joseph. And you remember how this story goes at the beginning. His brothers have now uh, put him down in a pit. He's ended up in Egypt and uh, through a very strange set of circumstances comes out now as the second to Pharaoh himself who was, uh, was in a vision given the understanding of uh, Sioux Falls utility that you have to plan for the year ahead and therefore make sure your si silos are filled and uh, you've got uh, plenty of water and everything that is needed for the uh, coming year. And uh, as Joseph himself was told, there are going to be seven fat years. That's when you load up. Then there are going to be seven lean years and you better be ready for that. Meanwhile, up at Cana, his brothers uh, have no idea what he's doing uh, and uh, what he's talking about. They find themselves in the midst of a famine. And in the midst of the famine, they go to the only place they can go, down to Egypt land, and lo and behold, they end up in the very courtroom of their brother Joseph 
but it's been too long, and they have understood all the, these years that he is dead and gone. They do not recognize him. And now, uh, for the first time, Joseph uses, uses the word truth in Scripture. He says, we will see now if there is any truth in these brothers. He is now actually going to go to work with them on the matter of the truth of the law. And the truth of the law now seeks to find the truth in the brothers in a particular way. How is it going to do this? Joseph creates an elaborate scheme now and says, I'm now going to set this whole thing up so that I tell them I'm going to give them uh, plenty of, uh, of, uh, of food to eat, plenty of grain, but only on one count. That is, if they're willing to leave one of the brothers behind, and I will uh, keep him in prison here until you go back and get the one brother you didn't bring, Benjamin. And when you do this, I want you to bring him back to me. He wanted to see if there was any truth in these lying brothers of his all these years. Meanwhile, the brothers go home and try to figure out what they're going to do. And uh, finally, they decide the only thing we can do is go and tell this man the truth. And lo and behold, they go back the next day and say, the truth is, we killed our brother. And there, Joseph hears for the first time what the law actually has said to them. You are not only lying, brothers, but you are killing, brothers. And I have been waiting for you to confess this truth all this time. Lo and behold, the brothers finally confess it. The truth is that we killed our brother, and I don't want to kill another. How do you like that? And therefore, I don't want to leave one of my brothers with you, whom you might kill, and I don't want to go and get my little brother, who, after all, is now the favorite back home, and uh, dad is not going to want this, and no one else is going to want it, and we ourselves don't want it. Killing one brother is enough. We don't want to kill anymore. How do you like that? Now Joseph says, I'm not done with the truth. It's one thing to have it come out of their mouth. Now I want to see if they uh, can actually follow through on this. Put their money where their mouth is. They go home. Lo and behold, they talk about this. They leave one of, the, uh, one of the brothers behind, the very one who identifies himself as the one who has put Joseph down in the pit so many years ago, and he now needs to pay for his crime. And he waits there in prison, and they bring back Benjamin, the favored son. And now comes the real test. So Luther steps back when he's teaching his uh, students about Genesis late in his life, and he says, now you're going to see a second truth come forward. The first truth that he had to rip out of them by the law, which otherwise they would never have confessed, I killed my brother. Now they actually have to hear another truth. But that truth is not going to come from their lips. It's going to come from Joseph's lips alone. And there was no one else who could possibly have given them what they need to hear at this particular time. Luther says, this is the great, great, marvelous, amazing absolution of Joseph, where Joseph is going to give them a forgiveness of sins unlike any other. No one has ever produced a better absolution in the entire world than Joseph. And it was all orchestrated by God uh, at the very beginning, and these very brothers who put Joseph down in the pit, and it all ended up in this situation. The only one who could ever forgive these brothers for killing their brother is the very brother they killed, who now stands right in front of them and is ready to give them their absolution, but only, he says, after I've played with them a little bit more. And so, as it is always the case with the Holy Spirit, you never want to spill the beans too fast. You want to play with them a little bit. Luther again says, this is what it means to be cooked and broiled over God's uh, fireplace. This is, uh, this is where he is actually going to play with you until he can bestow and give the absolution at the right moment, the right time, by the right voice, the very one who needs to actually give this absolution. 
So Joseph continues to play with the brothers. He, uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, he uh, sets up Benjamin as if Benjamin has stolen goods from him. Uh, and all of the money uh, that was given to Joseph, he puts back in a little uh, box that they carry back with them, and they find out too late that this money is in their possession rather than in the possession of Joseph, and now they're afraid that Joseph is going to come and convict them once again. And of course, they assume nothing else could happen, but Joseph, at the end of all of this, who now is going to reveal himself, is in fact going to attack them as the law always seeks to attack. It is always seeking now to mete out justice. And at the very moment now, when they turn back and they say, this money was found in our sacks, including in the sacks of Benjamin, and we now uh, want to give our, uh, uh, our condolences, our sorrow about this, then Joseph says, give me your brother." I want to have him all to myself. But they say, no. We will not give him up to you, lest you harm him. Now, Joseph says, the time is right for the absolution. Now is the time so that they can actually hear another truth than the truth of, I killed my brother. This truth is greater because it stands in front and says, the brother you killed is now standing right before you. I am he. And that very one now has something to say to you. I forgive you utterly and completely all of this. I see now that Benjamin is your love. Now I want to step back and ask something here. What started all this trouble from the very beginning between Joseph and his brothers. What started all the problems way back at the beginning when uh, Joseph was first put down in the pit? What started all of this stuff so that finally they had to be forgiven? It was the coat. It was the coat of many colors. Bible historians, shame on them, have decided that it the Hebrew doesn't mean many colors, it means really long. Well, that's not nearly so fun. <laughs> you know, you don't go down to, uh, you don't go down uh, to uh, see, a, see a Broadway show called uh, Joseph's Really Long Coat. I mean, yeah, that's, uh, anyway, uh, it's a coat of many colors. And uh, what, how did Joseph get it? His father gave it to him. Now this is the stupidest father of all time. What did he think he was going to do here with this? What was he thinking about the coat? Everybody knows that if you're going to give one son the coat, you must give all the other sons the coat as well. My parents sat me down uh, sometime, uh, 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 some years ago, explaining that on one particular Christmas, they did not spend the exact same money on my sister and my brother uh, as they did on me, and they were going to make it up by giving me 27 cents. <laughs> now, those are parents who do not want fights between siblings. Uh, and they're going to lay it out and make sure that everybody gets exactly the same. This is called fairness. This is called the matter of the law. This is called blind justice. This is the way you should be a parent. Well, it did seem to uh, f uh, f uh, get uh, f handed down in our family. Uh, one of my uh, relatives uh, had twins. And there he was in the uh, delivery room uh, his wife just recovering. He turns to the doctor. He's got both of uh, uh, the uh, sons in hand, and he says, one of them is handsome and one is ugly. <laughs> the doctor says, you shut your mouth. I never want to hear that again. Never tell this one it's ugly and that one it is, it is handsome, though it's true. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, this gets you into all sorts of trouble. 
the beginning of the trouble is the day now that Jacob decided he was going to give Joseph the coat and nobody else. This has a name. What's it called? Favoritism. Now, you actually uh, have this good old word from the Latin. He showed favor to one and not the other. This has another name. It's called election. He elected one and not the other. He chose one and not the other. He predestined one and not the other. And what did he predestine him to? Well, to being thrown down in the pit, to be, uh, to be reviled by his brothers. Uh, this was inevitable. This had to end up in this particular way. And lo and behold, you find not only that the story of Joseph is about election, but every single story in Scripture is about divine election. Everyone. And they're all unfair. I mean, you can figure out where Jacob got this. How did Jacob uh, decide that he was going to now turn to one of his sons and choose him? Because he had been chosen over Esau, who had legal rights. It was the firstborn primogenitor that belonged to Esau, who was the first one out of the womb of his mother, Rebekah. But Jacob was the one who was chosen. And in fact, this becomes the primary way that all of Scripture describes what God is doing all the time in the world and what God really wants out of all life. That is, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, period. How do you like that? All the prophets begin to pick this up. This is Micah. Uh, it's repeated in the Psalms. This is the way our God works. Now, who wants this God? No one. Unless you're Jacob or Joseph. <laughs> Even then, of course, uh, elected, it makes you very nervous since you know now that when you turn around with your coat of many colors, the first thing that's going to happen is that the people you run into are going to say, how did you get that? What was the reasoning behind this? What kind of nincompoop did this uh, and gave this to you rather than to me in this kind of situation? And in fact, all of Scripture is like this. And one of the reasons why stories in Scripture always turn on twins, uh, always turning back uh, to this matter of twins, uh, to brother against brother, one chosen and one not, and then to step back and say, what kind of a God do we have? And how is this actually working out? Because if you step back and ask yourself about this, then you'll start doing what uh, Joseph's brothers did, and that is that you will be jealous, you will be uh, frustrated, you will say, I do not like the system that I see operating, because it is unfair, it is unjust, it is not right, it is not fair and square, uh, it is not, now I'll use the term, legal. It's not, it doesn't operate according to the law. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here, this matter of uh, what God is doing in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in relationship to the law really becomes the main thing of all theology and really the main thing of all the stories of Scripture. What is God doing with the law, which he gives with one hand, and then with the other, he seems to operate entirely outside of it, hence our name, the outlaw God, who actually stands outside of this. Because when God uh, chooses, uh, loves uh, uh, Jacob and not Esau, he doesn't give any explanation for this. Now, over the years, what do you suppose Christian theologians have tried to do with every story in Scripture, including the story of Jacob I loved and Esau I hated? 
They go into the story of Jacob and Esau, and what do they look for? A reason why God chose Jacob and not Esau. Now, what do you suppose the reason that they, uh, that, uh, what, what is the reason that they're looking for? Luther says, this turns you into a detective rather than a preacher. How do you like that? And what does a detective do? It tries to find facts. And uh, specifically, it's looking for particular facts that it can uh, put on a, uh, on a statement and then read it out so that everybody can hear what the facts of the case are, who's right and who's wrong, who in fact now is a righteous human being and who is not. All of these things are being done now according to the rules of the law, and you tell me what people are looking for in the story of Esau. Say it again. Yes. Actually, this is true. I heard the answer. They're looking for what kind of offering is offered up. Sacrifice is actually given. And the uh, most famous version of this goes right back to the uh, beginning with Adam and Eve. And now you can take up uh, the, uh, the story of the first violation uh, of uh, the law against the brother, right? Uh, and here we have the story of Cain and Abel. And there uh, the story says um, they offered up their goods to God. One offered grain, the other the uh, first uh, sheep. And nevertheless, God, God took one of the sacrifices and did not take the other. But it pointedly does not say anything about why. And again, you can imagine what uh, Bible historians do. They go in and they say, this proves that grain is better than sheep. How do you like that? Uh, or uh, that uh, there is a shifting change now in the nature of agriculture itself, uh, where one is moving from uh, a type of agriculture that uh, that needs big, large fields, and th those that take up smaller fields, and so on. And then they try to decide which is better here, uh, raising animals or raising grain. And, of course, they all come out with the same answer. You should not eat meat. There's something basically wrong with that, right? So uh, here they come back, and they start laying out what they assume must be the problem. Yes, Jesus is the Lamb of God. Uh, that's exactly right. I, although I will have to come back to this. It doesn't say Jesus was the uh, wheat grain uh, of God. You are right about this. But it is interesting uh, that the very same word uh, for a wheat grain seed is the very word that is given to Abraham to describe who, uh, who is coming who will be uh, the, uh, the, the uh, great uh, producer of many nations. And there he simply calls him the seed. The seed, interestingly. But you are right. I mean, this is very interesting that uh, later on, uh, Jesus, uh, in John the Baptist's own mouth, is referred to as the Lamb. And then throughout the book of John, the, uh, the, uh, the gospel of John, he ends up specifically being the sacrificed Lamb. This is in part because uh, by this time in the temple, they had also made these same uh, uh, ideas uh, come to the fore. That is, which offering is a higher or better offering? Uh, can you offer a pigeon, and is that as good as a sheep or a lamb? Uh, or is this as good uh, as an ox? Uh, or uh, we also offer grain at various times. Is that one better? And whenever you're making these sacrifices to, to God, you put them in terms of the law, and when you put them in the terms of the law, you set them on a scale, and then you figure out which one God really likes and which one he doesn't like so much, right? And uh, there you seek to appease God's wrath through the nature of sacrifice. That's absolutely right. 
Now, uh, there are other ways to do this as well. So when it came back to Jacob and Esau, people always look for uh, not the deed itself, but somehow there must have been in the internals of someone like Esau some sort of bad disposition. And maybe it was that bad disposition that made God unchoose him, though he was legally first, and then choose, rather, Jacob, uh, who was legally second. Maybe that's the reason. Um, though they go further, and they say, well, two brothers could not have been more different. The one, Harry, born with a shotgun in his hands, going out hunting whenever he can possibly go out and hunting. The other one, mama's boy, always home with mama, helping clean up after dinner, has no hair. Well, maybe God likes a metrosexual uh, and uh, not a, 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 a army ranger or something like that. Maybe that's what's going on here. You can't believe how many uh, times people have dipped into these stories to try to figure out what was the reason that triggered in God to choose this one and not that one. And of course, we're always looking for some disobedience to the law that will give you the clue to determine what God is after. And then we st sit down and say, now I'm going to turn myself into God's perfect little child so that he can't possibly uh, unchoose me. He is going to choose me no matter what, right? So in this circumstance, we're already now in the thick of what Luther calls predestination sickness. Predestination sickness is when you spend your time trying to figure out what is God's formula for election. Why is he choosing this one and not that one? And then trying to determine whether you can turn yourself into a desirable object or not. And uh, as you go through life, when you get to my age and you are now uh, starting to uh, talk with your friends about 40 years ago, we did this, that, and the other thing. Then, uh, then of course, uh, you look back and say, I have tried to make myself electable by God all this time, and I don't seem to have gotten very far. Uh, I am not so sure that this choice is going to be made. And, as Luther observed, even when you feel one day that God favors you, the next day, all of a sudden, you start to wonder, maybe he doesn't favor me any longer. Maybe he was on my side at one moment, but maybe he is not on my side at the next. So Luther says, I fell into predestination fever all the way, and it nearly killed me because I was presenting to God what I assumed was the perfect person whom he couldn't help uh, but choose. And then I began to read Scripture and realized none of that mattered. Absolutely none of that mattered. Uh, all of my monastic practice, all of my perfection, all of my religiosity, my spirituality, all of these things now are presented to God as a sacrifice, and not only am I not sure he's taking it, he actually says, it is a stench in my nostrils. How do you like that? It is a stench in my nostrils. I'm not, I don't even want to be in the room here. Uh, and this is not how I choose. So. Uh, Luther began to turn to Paul's letter to the Romans and there began working with the matter of predestination and there in predestination you find two very important spots. One is in the ninth chapter of Romans where uh, Paul is taking up the issue of how it is that God chose the Jews. You remember that lovely poem? How odd of God to choose the Jews. <laughs> well, what, was his, what was he thinking? Uh, what was happening there? How did he make this particular choice? How could he choose the Jews over Vikings? 
you can't uh, possibly explain this particular matter. Well, uh, now uh, Paul takes up another issue. Uh, of course, uh, God has chosen the Jews, and Paul says, I am a Jew. However, the way he chooses is not the way we thought he chose. We thought he chose through the law of Moses, and suddenly we realize it doesn't have anything to do with Moses or his law. This is not at all the way God chooses and elects his own. He does not give the law through Moses, waits to see how well you do it, and then picks you out when you hit a certain mark where you say, well, I haven't done it all, but I've done at least as much uh, as my neighbor, and you ought to choose me rather than him. This is what it comes down to. And then, of course, everyone becomes jealous in relationship to everyone else, and we are all in a great competition in order to get in line for God's approval and his righteousness. And lo and behold, Paul says, that's not how he chooses at all. It's not how he chose in the very beginning. And especially with Abraham, it's not how he chose. Abraham came 430 years by the uh, cr uh, chronology of the rabbis before Moses, and nevertheless, Abraham was plucked out, not because he was anything so great. He was a wandering Aramean, meaning wandering here and there, uh, running all over, uh, believing in all sorts of gods. Then suddenly, God plucks him out, and here is the ticket. He gave Abraham a promise. That now is what Paul says is the way God chooses you. This is the way he chose Abraham, and it is the way he chooses everyone ever since. Paul says, how do you think I got here? It was not because I was so good at the law, though I was very good at the law, and I was better at the law than you. So don't come up and tell me I couldn't do it because I did the whole thing and I did it perfectly. I was zealous for the law, nevertheless, not the law. And the election of God came to me in a most, most shocking fashion. It was Jesus Christ himself standing in front of me saying, why do you persecute me with your law? This is what this means and instead now actually turned and spoke a very different word to me, one I had never heard, one I could never have made up, one that I cannot possibly imagine would be the way God elected, but this is the way he did it. He did it through mercy, and he said, not on your account, but on my son's account. I now forgive you. How do you like this? And now uh, Paul says, this is the way that God chooses. It's the way he chose Jacob. It's the way he chose Joseph. It's the way that he chose all the brothers of Joseph after the fact when Joseph finally could turn and give them their full and complete absolution. And in doing so now, God always chooses not by the law, but surely by mercy. Now, what is mercy? Mercy is not looking down on you and saying, well, you tried. You didn't do too well, but you gave it your best shot. Luther actually was taught this uh, by a whole uh, group in the seminary who said, um, do your best, God will do the rest. Luther says, you know, that was about the lowest bar you could possibly set uh, and then I realized this is not at all what uh, Scripture is talking about, how it is that God chooses. And then it began to dawn on me that predestination is the scariest thing in life until you actually get a promise. Then when you get a promise, it is no longer scary because then you want one thing and one thing only from your God. That is, God, when you gave me this promise, as you gave it to Abraham, as you gave it to Paul, as you gave it to Luther, whoever, when you give this promise, is there anyone who can screw it up? 
Is there any way that it can be undone? Is there any power that is greater in the world than your own power, O Lord? Or are you actually almighty? If you're almighty, it means that whatever you say goes no matter what, no matter who, no matter what sort of situations we come upon, no matter how I feel, no matter how much I perform. The question is, can you give a promise that no one can uh, break? Can you give a promise that Satan cannot overcome, that evil cannot overcome? that my own self cannot overcome, that uh, powers uh, around me in the world that seem so strong, uh, like politics or uh, judges or anyone, can anyone remove this particular power? And here is where Luther zooms in on this matter. If all you know about God is that he predestines but you don't have a promise, and then you hear that God is almighty and he necessitates everything in life, then you have the predestination sickness. Then you say, do you mean to tell me that God orders everything and preordains and determines? Then you say, I don't want to live in a world like that and I don't really believe it. I don't believe he uh, is uh, almighty in this way. But when you get a promise, this is a very different kind of thing. Then you do what Paul says in Romans chapter 9, and then you ask, is there any power in the universe that is greater than this power of the promise? Once you hear uh, the answer to this, of course, then the gospel breaks in, uh, and you can hear this in a new kind of way. But before we get there, I have to tell you that the church has been fighting about this from the very beginning. Can God give a promise that doesn't work? Can God give a unilateral promise that does not depend on even you? Is that possible? And here, uh, the uh, churches have divided over a period of time on this particular matter, not mostly in uh, Romans chapter 9, but in another place in Paul's letter to the Romans. It's Romans chapter 8, and I want to give you these particular verses. It's Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 31. Churches have thought about this uh, over and over again, and I want to show you how Luther himself works with this. Romans 8, 28 to 31. Paul is now writing to the Romans, We know that in everything God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, a very important word here, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among men, many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he uh, 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 called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Why, wh what then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? Now, this particular set of uh, sentences from Paul have been dissected, divided up, and have caused tremendous di dissension among the churches. I'm going to give you the three main ways they have been understood. The first one comes from the great teacher of the Latin church, actually all the, the, the church, Augustine of Hippo, all the way back now to the fourth century. Augustine said, look, we've got two different words there. God foreknew, pro genosco, knew ahead of time, and preordained or predestined. Two words, pro orzo. Augustine says that means God knows everything ahead of time. He sees everything and knows it all, but that does not mean he forces it to become that. So he says uh, God knows all, but he does not cause everything because of it. Very clever.
but wrong. <laughs> and uh, churches have been swimming in this for a long period of time. And Augustine himself knew it was wrong because later on he retracted it. Uh, I'm still waiting. Uh, Pastor Christofferson said, this was my magnum opus. This is not my magnus, magnum opus. That means the thing you write just before you die. Uh, this, uh, uh, <laughs> I have to have time for retractions. <laughs> Unless you really are like my uh, t teacher, Gerhard Ferdy, uh, uh, when, uh, when Gerhard Ferdy was, uh, was dying, I asked uh, Gerhard, is there anything that you, you ever changed your mind about? And he said, mm, no. <laughs> He's the only one I know who would ever say that. And if you knew him, he is actually the only one who never changed his mind. I mean, he came out of the womb as a Lutheran uh, and uh, uh, actually now understood how it was that God elected and ordained. And it was not this way. Now, uh, Augustine now says, it's one thing for God to know. He knows everything, but just because he knows it, it doesn't mean he causes it. What causes things to happen? Not God, but you and your free will, interestingly. So all of life then depends on your choices, your freedom. God just looks over it all, and he can know ahead of time which choices you are going to make, and he thinks you make some bad choices and some good choices, and you just hope in the end there are more good than bad. Here's another one and perhaps the most famous now, it comes from John Calvin. And therefore, John Calvin, Calvinism, reform teaching is especially associated with predestination, especially the so-called double predestination. I'll give you that in just a minute. John Calvin says, notice something in what Paul says. It's not that uh, God knows but doesn't cause things. Calvin agreed with everything Augustine said except this particular thing. And here he said, I can't live that way. It then would mean that I never know whether I'm elected or not, and uh, I live up to my last hour not knowing. I, I can't live that way. So Calvin says, I see something else that Paul did. Paul said, uh, those whom he predestined he also called. Now Calvin says two things here. First he predestines, and then he calls. This is famous from Calvin. So Calvin says, God predestined. When did he predestine? Before all time. Before all time, what happened? He lined absolutely everybody up who would ever exist in life and in military muster went down the line saying, you're mine, you're not. Uh, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, and went down the whole line. But here is the next thing. God will actually give you a hint as to whether you are chosen or not, and that is he'll call you after he has done this. So he predestines, then he sends you into the world, you're born, and then from this time on, he will actually give you what is called an inner call. Now, you'll notice something. Uh, Calvin added a little word there that's not in Paul. He said, inner call. And so Calvin says, this is what I will now depend upon. I will depend on a God who predestined before all time. He doesn't tell me whether I'm in or my, I'm out, but he will give me an inner call at the right time. Now, what is an inner call? Well, it is a blessing. It is a blessing, but it's a specific kind of blessing. It's a blessing that lets you know that you're elected. It would be like you carrying around your iPhone. Suddenly, it buzzes dramatically. And then you say, ah, the president is calling me. <laughs> uh, uh, however, uh, in this case, it has to be inside. And the alarm has to go off inside and say, God is calling me now. And all of uh, the reform tradition turns in this direction of saying, you will be certain if you turn inward and identify whether you have this call inside or not. It will be a strong feeling or it will be a strong thought 
there will be a strong sign that's given. And what are preachers there to do? To help you interpret this inner voice. It's very interesting. Luther comes in and says all of that is completely wrong. What God is doing is not uh, uh, predestining before all time and not telling you. He is actually choosing and electing you, but he chooses and elects you in a particular place and time and by a particular means, which is definitely not inside you, but outside of you. This is called a verbal and external word, and the first time it happens to you is baptism. And when it comes to you in that baptism, what has God done? He's given you a promise in the same way he gave it to Abraham, in the same way he gave it to Jacob. And when he does that, what he's doing is clothing you in a bright, lovely, many-colored rainbow cloak. Now, what happens to you after this happens? Well, of course, the world puts you down in a pit because you have a many-colored coat. And you run around saying, I've been chosen. Uh, and everybody else looks at you and says, nobody would choose you. That can't possibly be correct. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, you say, no, I'm certain about this. One of my students once had a little group of children, uh, and uh, she turned to them and said, are you chosen by God? And they looked at her blankly. She said, are you elected by God? Do any of you know this? Uh, has he ever chosen you over all other possibilities in life? They looked at her dumbfounded and said, well, I don't know. Would you like to be chosen by God? Would you like to be on his team? Uh, well, yes. Then she said, well, all right, then I'm going to choose you. And went down the line, one after the other, choosing them. He, I hereby choose you on account of Jesus Christ. This is an actual authority that is given to anyone who is baptized and is the responsibility of those who are ordained to see to it that they actually do this and bestow the promise in time and place and elect you right there. Then, of course, whenever you give this, at whatever time, you turn someone back and say, this was first given to you in your baptism, and it can never be taken away. Paul now puts the great final question uh, to this uh, promise of baptism. What if somebody gets baptized and they're unfaithful? They don't believe it. They don't trust it. They don't do it, whatever that might be. Paul says, what if some are unfaithful? God is faithful, and God is the one who cannot be overcome. You are easy to overcome. God is uh, the one who cannot be overcome, and the reason he cannot be overcome is that he is almighty, no power is greater, and when he gives a promise, it is preordained, and there is no taking it back. Now, at that juncture, of course, uh, Luther uh, turns uh, to the next matter that we have in front of us, what happens once you receive this election and you actually suffer in the world rather than are given power and glory? What actually happens in your life? What happens to Joseph when he's given the promise? What happens to Jacob when he's given the promise? What happens to Abraham when he's given the promise? What happens to you when you're given the promise? That we have to take up next time, right? All right, so this is a, a first step into the, uh, the, the, uh, this matter of predestination. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the, uh, all of the churches fight over this 
particular understanding of, uh, of predestination and the various interpretations of Romans 8, including especially the Norwegians. The Norwegians loved this fight. They spent all of their time on this particular fight. And uh, in point of fact, all of the churches in this country broke over the uh, predestination argument and especially the Norwegians. They fought for years and years. And lo and behold, some of them became anti-Missourians who did not like the way predestination was talked about in the Missouri Synod, and they created St. Olaf College because of it. <laughs> How do you like that? We don't want you anymore. We're going to make our own little place on the hill up here uh, at St. Olaf. Uh, and uh, we're going to establish our teaching of, uh, of uh, predestination uh, in our own way. But meanwhile, there are those Norwegians uh, in the Synod who broke away from those groups as well and established an even greater institution uh, called the Norwegian Augustana Synod. How do you like that? And they said, we're actually going to hold on to the whole book of Concord, not only the small catechism, including the 11th article of the formula of Concord, which is on election, and we are going to stand by baptism as the true uh, election, come hell or high water, and we're going to prove it by going to Canton, South Dakota. Uh, and we're going to build a, 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 a we're going to, well, they, they didn't build, buy a building, isn't this right? Uh, and actually, establish our, uh, our palace there, and then uh, when uh, they got really uh, shifty, moved it up to Sioux Falls uh, and established uh, Augustana uh, as forever the place that Lutheran teaching on divine election, Formula of Concord, Article 11, just as I've taught it to you now, will stand forever. <laughs> Well, it hasn't worked out quite that way, uh, it's, it's just, just the way we might want. But nevertheless, lo and behold, your Pastor Christofferson has given me this time and occasion to stand in front of you and bestow it and give it to you. <laughs> Here you are, elected, and if you do not have your baptism, I am happy to do it. We will find water, and I will bestow it on you now before you go. But. Assuming now you've received your promise, let's turn it back over to you and see what kind of comments, observations you want to make. Yes? Yeah. No, that's not true. But uh, but Ro but Romans is Galatians. Uh, in fact, none of those are forgeries. Galatians, in particular, is important here. But I'm going to hold to your observation. You're asking, what do you think people in Rome thought when Paul wrote to them about predestination? They were as happy as they could be. Why? They were Gentiles with a future. There might well have been Jews there as well. We do not know this for sure, but there certainly were Gentiles. And why were the Gentiles happy to hear this? Because they were not the chosen ones. They knew what the story of the Old Testament was. They didn't have to be able to read, although many of them could, and they knew what the story was. The story of the Old Testament is that God has chosen the Jews. Now you're sitting there in Rome and you're a Gentile and you have no idea how it is that you are ever going to get the favor of God. Suddenly, Paul says to them, this comes to you in the form of a promise and I have been authorized to give it to no goods like you. Uh, who don't know anything, who have never achieved anything, who have never gotten anywhere, and are nothing other than stupid Gentiles. 
and I now have to give this to you. Paul even holds his nose. He's telling you this. I've got to hold my nose and hand it over to people like you, and they were as happy as clams to get it. So they said, Paul, please come as quickly as you can. I can't wait to hear it right from the horse's mouth. It's nice to read it in a letter, but I'd love to have you come and actually just say it straight out to me. And uh, uh, Paul says, I'm, I'm coming. I'm getting there. I'm not quite there yet, all right? Happy as could be. They, did, they were not asked to take a, uh, a, a test for high intellect. The problem here is not that you have to think high intellect thoughts. The high intellect thoughts is the problem because high intellect says what kind of a God chooses this kind of people that have, that have not produced what they should. They are not good. They are not right in themselves. They have not fulfilled the law. And nevertheless, he comes in out of mercy, gives them his promise through nothing of worth in themselves. And they knew exactly what that meant. The poorer they were, the more they wanted it. The, the less education they had, the more they said, that's the gospel, if I've ever heard it. And they did not need to hear it through... Uh, uh, a, a high IQ person, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, one of the things we're doing here is noticing what happens over time when people intellectualize all of these. And when they intellectualize them, they go into the story and they say there must be a secret method of gods to uh, elect the better type. But there isn't. That's good news, uh, and it was good news in Rome, believe me. It was really good news in Rome. It's one of the reasons the church grew like crazy there. Yeah, good. Others? Yes? All right, let's take up Judas. Okay, let's take up. But, yeah. uh, also now, now you're going too far off. Now you're going too far off. Let me quiet. Let me list. Let me tell you about Judas. Let me tell you about Judas. So, in uh, in my book, you will identify the three main stories of predestination. The first one now is uh, uh, Jacob in Esau, which I've been talking to you about. The second one is the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. How is it that it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart? The third is Judas. How does Acts say that, uh, that Judas' betrayal was predestined from the beginning? And this seems so terrible and so unfair, and it seems so unpolitically correct, etc. Now, here is where we have to come back to this story of Judas and put it in its proper context. Remember I said election always involves the contrast of two. Jacob and Esau. Who is the contrast of Judas? Peter. Now, here's the question. You put Judas and Peter side by side. One of them is elected and chosen, Peter. The other one is not elected and not chosen, Judas. What is the thing that differentiates these two? Oh, you say, Judas was a betrayer. Well, how about Peter? Uh, you could even make a case, as a good lawyer would, well, dear Lord, Judas only betrayed you once. Peter did it three times. <laughs> Shouldn't you in some way address uh, Judas in the same way that you would address Peter? Now tell me, what is the difference between Judas and Peter that makes the difference between an elect and non-elect? It's not that one was bad and the other is good. It's not that one used free will or the other one di uh, did not or something like that. Remember where, where Judas went and what happened when it suddenly dawned on him that he had betrayed 
his own master. Where did Judas go? Say it again. Well, that's where he finally ended up. Where did he go first before he hung himself? He went back to the temple, and then he tried to return the money he had gotten, which was to make right his wrong. And what did he need to get from the temple? Why do you go to the temple? For absolution, for forgiveness of your sin. And what did he get? He got the coins thrown back at him and no words spoken. And there he has an absolutely silent God who has not said a single thing. And when God goes silent, then the terror begins. And the terror was so great for him that he could not overcome it. And he thought the only way to freedom is to hang himself and end it all. Now, what happens to Peter? Peter is betrayed as well. Peter is on the run. He doesn't, Peter doesn't even return to the temple where you would get absolution. Where does Peter go? He hides. Uh, and he does not want to be found, and he doesn't want to see anybody to talk about what just happened. And then, lo and behold, what happened to him? One day, he's hiding behind a closed door. In comes Christ. Christ now turns to Peter and says something. What does he say to Peter? Peter, I know what you did. <laughs> I know all about it. Now Peter is shaking in his boots and he's waiting for what this Lord is going to say. And the Lord says, I forgive you, Peter. And now he says, the keys of the kingdom which I have given to you, the plenary absolution, uh, I now want to give to all these who have come and all of these receive this, uh, this, uh, the keys to the kingdom who then turn around and elect all of those uh, sheep of my own fold. Now we uh, can put the relationship between Peter and, uh, and, and Judas into the proper light. One gets a preacher. The other does not. How are you elected? Well, you get a preacher. How do you get a preacher? Well, you won't get a preacher, Paul says, Romans chapter 10, unless one is sent. And how is one sent? Unless it's sent by the Holy Spirit. And how will the Holy Spirit do this? Uh, unless over the mountain they come. And the, 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 the feet of those who come over the mountain are blessed so that they come and actually bestow and give you this this election. I mean, no wonder you have uh, this place at First Lutheran where you can come and regularly get your election. Otherwise, you go out there in the world, you lose your ear for God and Christ, even your great promises, you no longer can hear Him, and as you, uh, you no longer hear Him, things get darker, uh, more difficult, until finally you have to take things into your own hands. Here now you come and actually receive this great uh, promise, and this is why you have occasions like this. This is also why you have the uh, pastors that we have here. This is how also you have become royal priests who can actually turn and give this to other people as well. So this is how you actually take those who are currently Judases in the world and make them into Peters where they're actually waiting to come and uh, hear this particular word from you. Yeah? Good. So without the baptism, there is no promise? Correct. Uh, this is stated very clearly in, uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, Book of Concord, uh, the Augsburg Confession, the small catechism, and, of course, in Scripture, this is especially in Titus, baptism is salvation. Now, of course, the churches have always fought about this. They always uh, try to move baptism uh, into the role of an initiation or beginning, but not enough. Because if baptism is initiation and not enough, then what must come after it? What must you add to this? You must add something to this. I hear the word confirmation. I hear the word my decision. I hear uh, the, uh, the, you must 
add your act into this particular matter, and then I will ask you, what now is your faith utterly dependent upon at that moment? Your act, your feeling, your move, your act. Baptism is once and for all because you keep getting turned back to it day in and day out. So Luther says in his small catechism, our entire life is to be turned back to baptism over and over and over again. And if you think that gets tiring, uh, you ought to then go out yourself and try to establish your own salvation. That's tiring. Uh, and uh, it's much better actually to return to the promise each night Yes, O oh Lord, you made this promise. And you know when you especially need to say this? Not when you're feeling good and feeling like, I could really make my decision for you or I can really commit to you. I'm confirming, you know, my faith and so on. Those are good days. What you, when you really need this are the days when you do not have anything in the tank left. And there isn't anything in you to say, I once felt the spirit, I don't feel it right now. I once was sure that you loved me, but now there are things going on in my life that make me wonder. And those are the days where you say, now I remember that you have given me a promise, and that promise is entirely held by your faithfulness, not my faithfulness. When a promise is given, what does the promise depend upon? The one who's getting the promise or the one who makes the promise? The one who makes the promise and then everything depends on whether the promise maker can actually deliver the goods, come through when you need it. And now the question is, can God come through every obstacle and get to me? This is what we mean by predestination. What is God's destination? He wants to get to you with his promise. He knows this ahead of time, and come hell or high water, he is coming to get you. And nothing is going to stop him. That's what Paul means when he says, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God and Jesus Christ. Uh, this, there's a, that lovely book called The Hounds of Heaven. Do you remember this? This is the unleashing of the hounds of heaven. He will never stop before he gets to you. And some of you, of course, are, 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 are more fun game for him. Uh, you're, you're more rare. Uh, you, you know, this is where you really have to hunt and you have to have a high-powered rifle. Uh, you have to go from a long distance because you're skittish and you might run. Uh, and then he'll nail you. Most of you are South Dakota pheasants. <laughs> you, uh, you get flushed really easily and bing, 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 uh, and now he's got you right where he wants you, and lo and behold, you know, you're members of First Lutheran. Uh, yeah, th um, th that's, uh, th this is what we mean finally by God coming to us in baptism, and baptism now is not a requirement, it is a gift. This is what this is. I don't have to have it in order to have a pass. I need to have it in order to have a promise, and that promise now is the thing that he gives me. That's the only thing that faith can hold on to, the only thing it can cling to. And uh, there, uh, that uh, baptismal promise is the best of all. Why? Why is the baptismal promise the best of them all? I mean, the absolution you get on Sunday is really good. I'd say, you know, it's like a B, a B plus. Why, why, is, uh, why, is, why, why is baptism a full A plus? You can't do any better. Because it's once and for all. It is completely unconditional. Uh, and there you will hear what your Lord is actually saying to you, how he's actually choosing and electing. Comment. Better yet. 
Let me, let me, let me take uh, two things there, because your, your question is, um, you were talking about the, this student of mine who was uh, speaking to the children, would you like to be elected, and so on, and then you said you're reminding them, this is actually absolutely right, but here I want to uh, use the, uh, the proper grammar. What you do and when you elect is you do not elect in the past, that is, only reminding them. You elect in the present now. This is always the way the absolution finally is given. Uh, not a long time ago, God forgave your sins. So on Sunday, I'm not going to absolve you by saying, uh, many, many years ago, God forgave you. Uh, good luck. I'm now going to say right now, right here, in this place, I forgive your sin. That's what, that's what the, uh, the election is. It's in time and place and especially is now. It's what we call present tense. Once you have it in the present tense, then you can say to the children, now, this uh, promise that I've just given to you right here, right now, I've cho I choose you, I choose you, I choose you on account of Christ. That promise is no different than the one that you got, some of you before you even knew that it was given to you. Some of you did know this, but it was given to you in baptism. So first, present, now. Then I can turn them back and say, this is the same promise you've had for a long time. I am now putting it back in your ear. So that's why uh, our absolution is always here and now. That's why Joseph would not turn to his brothers after all of these shenanigans and say, you know, remember when you put me down in the pit and you, you basically killed me and uh, you left me for dead and everything? Don't worry about it. That's a long time ago. It doesn't really matter. Now, that is not a promise. And it is not an absolution. That's asking them to go back and remember things and so on. What he wants to do right here and now is, I'm Joseph, your brother, the one you killed, I forgive you your sin, right here and now. This is what we call the present tense of the matter. When you have the present tense, then you can also go and get the past tense. This promise has been given to you long ago. But now I'm letting you hear it again, all right? Does that help a little bit with that? All right, good. Enough? We can meet again on Tuesday. Well, we have uh, another. I, I know some of you have to get going. I'll be fast, huh? God, you're saying that the message, I, I'm letting uh, people who will uh, hear this, the message has been timely for you. Yeah. So back, back then, when you were in high school, First Lutheran had a Sunday where, where youth would, would, would speak from the pulpit. You heard a strong and courageous sermon from one of your friends. Yeah.
What happened to him? What happened to him? He deserted from the army. He came back, and you said that he needed absolution for the, his own experience of deserting, is it? I, at this point, I think we do have, I, I, it's important, but I think you have to get right to the nub of the matter. What, uh, what, what either bothers him or you at this point about his situation? Yeah. Yeah. Has he ever found a, a freedom, as far as you know, from this uh, possession? Is he, free, is he free now or is he not free? Is he free now? Does he know or not free? I, I, this is an important story. I think you and I can continue this later. Let me see if I could at least say uh, something to you and then later you and I will talk this through. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I, can I make an observation, and it might be the one that you're connecting to. Jo when uh, when, when uh, Joseph uh, suddenly had his brothers in front of him, he realized what his calling in life was all about. It wasn't to fill the grain silos, uh, silos in Egypt. His entire calling in life was to have the moment in time where he would utter the forgiveness and the lifting of the weight, the removal of the demon from these brothers. That is very likely in preparation for you now. And you said you've got a little plan going? Good. You and I uh, will sit and talk about it. This is one of the great joys of the gospel. It's planning how to lay the absolution in where it looks like it's unwanted, hated and could never go. And that's when the Holy Spirit really steps up to deliver. Yep. Good. And then I will suggest that you bring your water and you know what the words are. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right? You and I will talk about strategy. Many thanks, uh, everyone. Tuesday we'll uh, get together again. On behalf of all of us gathered tonight around God's Word, Dr. Paulson, many, many thanks. Um, in my mother tongue, Mungatusantuck. <laughs> I'm one of those pheasants that <laughs> goes down easy. 
Yeah. <laughs> and what are one those, of those more playful And one of those attacks. Norwegians always arguing about uh, predestination. Yes, yes. <laughs> we go back and forth. Um, so at this time, we have a reception. Uh, again, many thanks to those on behalf of the um, Education and Discipleship Board who are hosting this. Um, Dr. Paulson's book is for sale in the atrium, and so you're all invited to uh, join together for a time of fellowship. And next week, uh, speaking about promises, we will have heat in this sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Lyle? <laughs> um, and also, um, uh, to remind you, next Tuesday, uh, Dr. Paulson will uh, deliver um, the next piece now, uh, that matter that is on all of our lives at different points uh, to different degrees, and that is um, the problem of evil in the world and in our lives. So, 6.30 next Tuesday, we hope to see you then. God's grace. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.